Today's episode is sponsored by Mud Water. Mud Water is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With one seventh the caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get energy without the anxiety, jitters, or crash of coffee. Each ingredient was added for a purpose cacao and chai for mood and a microdose of caffeine, lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to help support physical performance, chaga and rishi to support your immune system, turmeric for soreness, and cinnamon for antioxidants. If you're a longtime listener to the show, you may have heard me say I'm having a cup of mud during an episode before. My current favorite is the new Rest Blend, a non-caffeinated tea, which has become part of my evening routine. And not only am I an avid customer, but I love the product so much I became an investor in the company. If you haven't listened already, check out episode 259, when I spoke to Mudwater founder and CEO Shane Heath about why he started the company. Mud is Whole30 approved, 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Go to mudwater.com slash meb to support the show and use the code mebmud for $5 off. That's mudwater.com slash meb and use the code mebmud for 5 bucks off. And now, back to the show. Jeremy, my man, welcome back to the show. Howdy. Good to see you again. You know, we had you on almost a year to the day, beginning of February, a year ago. And we thought we'd have you back on because it was just this quiet year. Nothing has transpired in the year since uh, we had boring. you, <laughs> as, as always with markets. Um, but, you know, I thought uh, I'd let you walk us forward a little bit from last year because we talked a lot about the crazy times that were going on. Um, and then fast forward a year later, the last month notwithstanding as much, the market kept going up, or at least the U.S. stock market did, the broad-based. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about what's, uh, what's transpired in the last 12 months uh, in, the, in the world of investing. Very quickly, I don't think it was the broad-based that went up. Um, almost a half of the NASDAQ stocks are down 50% from their high. And the one or two of the superstars of the craziest ones had already started down when we spoke. My favorite QuantumScape, a SPAC that came at 10, went to 130 worth $55 billion with four years still to wait before they had any revenues, forget profits. And the biggest holding I had ever had in my life, it made me personally, to be blunt, a quick $500 million uh, on paper, but it couldn't be sold for six months. and I opine that it would probably not get to the six months. And by the time the six months was up, it was down to 25. So it was down 80%. Today it's 15. And that has led the charge. But by the middle of last year, it was joined by a lot of the AMCs, the Bitcoins, and, and the game stocks, the meme, the meme stocks in, in short, the meme ideas, since Bitcoin isn't a stock, and they, they kind of peeled off and joined in. The whole SPAC index was a disaster. Uh, the um, Kathy Woods um, ETF went down 50, 60%. Uh, and, and they were the more exciting stocks of the previous year. And this is eerily like um, 2000. In 2000, the growth stocks the, the TMTs, they call them, technology, media, and telecom. They peeled off, starting with the flakiest and most speculative first, the ones who tripled the year before. And then it worked the way through the system until it finally got to Cisco. But by the fall, they were down badly, and, and the rest of the market was still up. So the S&P, uh, on September the 1st, to be exact, I looked at it yesterday, got back to where it had been in March. And the NASDAQ itself, off a, off a big hit, had a big rally uh, in the summer. And then the whole thing rolled over and everything went down 50%. Incidentally, the ones that had been hit by 30 or 40% also went down 50% from a, uh, a worse starting point. So the NASDAQ ended up minus 82. And that pattern has been creepily like the one we've been watching. So that 12 months ago, uh, yes, the S&P is still up eh, 16%, but the Russell 2000 is down. And that's the one we short against our, uh, 
huge holding of, uh, of VC. And so that hasn't been nearly as painful as you would suggest. Yeah, well, I, I think that you and I had almost nailed to a T. I mean, you and I were talking about sentiment and how, you know, the peak of the bubble was like the most euphoric time. And last February, you know, when we were talking about this, it was up there, right? And then um, even in the ensuing months, you, you kind of talked about this where it's still euphoric, just a little bit less so. Um, but a lot of those names, um, I tweeted about this. I was like, you know, this feels like one of those times when you blink and a bunch of these high flyer names are down 40, 60, 80%. Um, but most importantly, Jeremy, did you get liquidity on Quantum Scape? Are you still holding it? I mean, this, you, I think you mentioned we the time. Sold, uh, to be honest, we sold 75% the first week or two that we could, and we got 25. And then uh, more recently, it had a bit of a rally. And, uh, and we sold uh, 20% of what we had left. And um, at 15 or 16, I guess we're in no man's land. Below 10, we might even start to buy it again. Yeah. It's a brilliant well, little company. And I, it could one day be a complete monster with the solid state batteries. Uh, everyone has talked about it. No one's done it. But these guys are pecking their way step by step through through the problems i think with any luck but so but, it's funny because like as you look at the the career arc you know you mentioned at one point like on paper by far the biggest uh, gainer but also the biggest loser right from the, yes from the biggest peak. gainer the biggest loser yeah and, um, um i'm trying to think what the one in in 2000 was called but it it tripled or quadrupled in 99 and then led the parade down i have too much ptsd from that time because i owned all the names you know i was in university i had cmgi i had lucent technologies like all the way down i was uh, i was the owner of all of those but um i it's still i still viscerally can feel uh the experience but you know as i was talking last year because i had um uh, done startup investing and a spac that i had invested in Oh, sorry, excuse me, a startup I have invested in that was in the aerospace uh, had, went public via SPAC at a crazy valuation and, and much smaller scale, of course, but did the same thing. It went from 10 to 20 something. And I think it's at like two now. So um, it's still up from the angel investment, but uh, not, not a 50 bagger, whatever it might've yes, been. Yes, yes. The guy who runs our foundation for the protection of the environment, he and I were sitting around spending spending those hundreds of millions that slipped through our fingers. Yeah. Well, so anyway, uh, let's, so suddenly the world has changed a bit. And as a historian, I can say with confidence that these geopolitical events are murderously difficult to predict. If you could tell me how long it would last, you know, you, even then it would be difficult, but it, it could, in a month, they could have a regime change in Russia and we could be in a honeymoon period again. Or this could drag, drag on to be absolutely the start of a multi-year super cold war, uh, and, and it would have repercussions everywhere. Wars are not obviously bad for stock markets. They do set in, in process a lot of capex, a lot of new products, a lot of war profiteering, if you will. Um, so it isn't necessarily a, a, a doom for the stock market. It's a miserable time for everybody else, but in wartime, people do work harder and produce more. Well, it reminds me of the old Rothschild quote, is like buy on the sound of cannons, sell on the sound of trumpets. Um, but we, we talked a little bit about this during the coronavirus, during March, I had you know, done a yeah. post where said, um, look, you could very easily make a bull and a bear case. Like the bear case is there's variants, the vaccines don't work, health systems are overloaded, markets are already expensive, they keep going down. You could make the bull case, which is kind of what transpired, that the vaccines work, you know, things progress and the stock market's hitting all-time highs again. But when I posted that, I remember people were just like, oh my God, that's crazy, that will never happen. But here you find yourselves like with the Russia thing, which is probably even more unpredictable but you see a scenario very easily like what's the most likely outcome what are the possibilities on each side and i think the one that you mentioned um 
is a real possibility, but who who knows? Like that's that's the future is unpredictable. And you have from my to sort point of, of view, mm-hmm. we had enough unpredictability anyway without right. this. And I had I had become pretty confident that we were from a psychological point of view, running through the usual game. And we were losing confidence in the high flyers, losing confidence in the super specs. And and I thought the probability of a recession in the next year or two uh, was pretty high. Uh, And I thought sooner or later with all the debt around, that is going to trigger a, uh, at least a partial uh, financial crisis. So you have a, a plentiful supply of, of big negatives that could happen. And, and as you get out a year or two, you get into this field where I think the long-term outlook for inflation is really quite bad because we are basically running out of resources. We're getting very tight on both labor and important raw materials. You know, the cheapest copper ores and lithium, cobalt, nickel, the stuff you need to electrify the system, they've all gone. We, we have no great CapEx projects up our sleeve. We've actually, since China slowed down in 2011, the CapEx has dwindled way down. There aren't plentiful reserves. So as we gear up to decarbonize, we'll be bumping our head, almost guaranteed on shortages from time to time of these critical metals. And then you have the problem of labor, which in a short-term basis, everyone's saying, where have they all gone? But in a long-term basis, I can tell you where they've gone. They were never born. You know, there is no improvement in, in the baby output over the last 20 years. We have slightly been declining. So we can guarantee, since they're already alive, that the supply of 20-year-olds entering the market in the developed world, in the US and in China, will be declining. This is totally unlike the Goldilocks era of the last 20 years, or indeed the post-World War II era. We've had a a plentiful supply of of new labor. And and in Japan, of course, we had all those semi-redundant farmers plowing into into the cities and getting plugged into a very, frankly, a very efficient, hardworking capitalist system, 500 million of them, and then 200 million Eastern Europeans uh, actually starting to seriously work. So that completely glutted, if you will, the global labor market and put pressure on labor everywhere. And now you wave your magic wand and you find quite abruptly China's gone from an excess labor supply to a shortage around the corner. And so have we. I keep an eye on ag prices a lot. We have some farmland and wheat's darn near pushing on $10 a bushel right now. Um, last time we were here, uh, Arab Spring was going on and you know the food prices certainly created a lot of stress around the globe. I feel like that's been a little bit lost and what's going on this year, certainly um, dealing yeah. with the, the Russia invasion, but um, no one seemed to really be talking about that much, at least in my kind of well, um, feed. I, I, I've been talking about it all the time because the UN food index is back to those highs of 2011. And Ukraine is not a bystander. Ukraine is part of the great breadbasket of Europe. It's where wheat comes from into the export market. So if you're an Egyptian, you know, half your imported wheat comes from the Ukraine. So uh, th- this is entirely relevant. And you add together the change in the weather, at least in the Arab Spring, people weren't obsessing about floods, droughts, and, and higher temperatures. Uh, but that has become painfully more obvious in the last 10 years. And it's making agriculture very difficult. What do you think this this kind of analog is there such, you know, as we look back, is this a slight 70, early 70s vibe? Uh, Is there another period that feels similar to you or either whether it's in the US or globally or anywhere that's kind of a similar market setup that we have today? Well, every every system is so complicated, they're always different. But 
I think the last 20 years has been completely different. <laughs> Indeed, I wrote a quarterly letter in, in, in 2017 saying I couldn't find anything that wasn't different. Um, and that the four most dangerous words in investing were not, this time is different, but really the five most dangerous words were this time is never different. Because from time to time, things absolutely change and they changed in the early 21st century. And, and we went to a regime of kind of corporate paradise where PEs were not just higher than the previous 60 years, they averaged 60% higher, where profit margins were not just higher, but they averaged close to 40% higher. So profits as a percentage of GDP went up several points and wages as a percentage of GDP fell a few points. So these are profound differences and they were accompanied by the lowest interest rates in the history of man, which declined for 20, well, they declined for 50 years, but they declined the entire 21st century. And the supply of debt rose more rapidly than probably any other 20 year period outside a major war. So everything had changed. I think what is going to happen is that it's changing back. We are going back in many ways to the 20th century. Inflation has been a non-issue in this Goldilocks era for 20, 22 years. I am proud to say I wrote 20 years of quarterly letters and I never featured inflation. It was completely boring and, and out of my interest zone. And, and in the 20th century, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, as investment managers, of course, you could not ignore inflation. I think inflation is always going to be part of the discussion once again. It's not always going to be 7% or 17%. It's going to ebb and flow, but it, was, but it will always be thought about again. For the last 20 years, we forgot about it. And uh, PEs depend on two things, profit margins and inflation. If profit margins are high, inflation is low, you have a very high PE. You go back to the 70s, you have high inflation, low profit margins, you sell at seven times depressed earnings. And then in 2000, you sell at 35 times peak earnings. This is double counting of the worst of the worst variety. And we have been selling at peak PE of peak profit margins recently. That is not a point that you want to jump off if you have the choice. You want to start a portfolio in 1974. PE is seven times. Profit margins are about as low as they get. Paradise. How can you lose money? You do not want to start at the opposite where we were a year ago. You know, I uh, I posted on that topic this past year, and it's probably the number one uh, angriest responses I got on Twitter. And I said, look, this is even my work. I mean, you can look at Rob or not. You can look at Gmo. A million other people have talked about this. It's very easy to see in the data. Um, but you guys have a beautiful chart. I think it even goes back to the, uh, 100 years or so. But um, overlaying kind of a predicted PE based on the inputs you yeah. discussed. Uh, and there's a really high correlation, but there's two periods that kind of really stick out, <laughs> you know, now and there 2000. Are. And 2000. Um, and they largely result. Pretty, right. I'm shocked that you say 100 years, but of course, 1925 is suddenly almost 100 years. But it, it tracked 1929 beautifully and, and the 30s with low PEs and the 50s recovering. And, and the only thing it got materially wrong, as you say, is 2000. In 2000, we predicted all profit margins and, P and, and, and inflation predicted the highest PE in history. And we had the highest PE in history, only it wasn't 25, it was 35. So it went 40% higher. And for two years, that was possibly the only really crazy psychology uh, ever because it, it took perfect conditions and, and then inflated those, if you would, by, uh, by 40%. And now, starting just after we spoke a year ago, the thing diverged again. It was beautifully on target when we spoke. And then a month or two later, inflation started to rise rapidly. And the PEs, instead of going down, went up. And I can say with a clear conscience, nothing like that has ever happened since 1925. When PE goes from 
you know, zero to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the market crashes. And this time it behaved. You can explain the current PE, the PE of December 31st. You can explain it by saying not that it's 7% inflation, but that it's perfect inflation. It's 1.9 and stable, not 7% and unstable. That has always been a bane uh, on, on, on PEs, but not this time. This time, the world 100% believed that the Fed was right when it said it was temporary, which is, which is remarkable. Given the Fed's record of getting nothing right, I find it <laughs> bewildering that the world would believe them, but they do. You mentioned inflation. Uh, I had a joke where I said, what if the Fed gets together, they write up all these fancy notes, but what, all they really do is they drink some beers, watch Seinfeld, and then just peg the Fed funds rate to the two year. I say, you'd probably be better off. It's a pretty close series if they just don't tell anyone they were doing it and just peg it to it. But they're consistently been under it the last few years. Um, would we be, we'd be better off with a robot? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I think we'd be better off if uh, the Fed had the simple instructions to, to keep a, a very steady supply of money available, yeah. uh, commensurate with the growth rate, the provable growth rate, uh, the intermediate term trend line growth rate of the economy. But they have all of these delusional uh, instructions, control the growth rate, control inflation, control this, control that. It's all outside their capabilities, but they have learned that they can stimulate the stock market. It's not clear that they're that good at stimulating the economy, uh, but they can certainly stimulate asset classes, particularly the stock market. Um, in the short term, they can, they can cause the economy to do well, but just, just reliably for a quarter or two, and then um, anything can happen. And uh, I'm, I'm glad, I do sympathize with them. When, when COVID struck and the economy goes into free fall and confidence collapses, you know that you need some strong action from the Fed and you know you need some strong action from, from, um, on a fiscal basis from the government. And the question is not trivial, how much? And uh, guessing how magnificent that it has to be to do a good job without guaranteeing several years of inflation is a pretty tricky job. And uh, with hindsight, it's fairly clear to me that they probably put in about twice as much as they had to, twice as much stimulus of all kinds as was necessary. But how were they to know? The Europeans and the rest of the developed world probably put in a little less than half as much as the US, and they did fine. But the US bounced back faster, but also they have the highest inflation and they have the most intractable looking inflation of any developed country. And they're probably going to keep that way for quite a while as that huge unprecedented spike in money uh, kind of flows through the system. And where that will leave us with these debt levels, if there is a crisis, we, we will find out one day, perhaps. The, um, one of the things you talked about uh, that I think is, is interesting implications, um, you referenced it jokingly with your quantum scape um, holding, but this concept of like a hedonic adaptation to wealth, and we have the highest uh, net worth in the US relative to GDP and many metrics, but much of that simply due to um, stock valuation uh, on your balance sheet, you know, personal balance sheet of all individuals in this country, right in line with housing. Um, that goes down, let's say theoretically, like a normal bear market, you know, we go down 40, 50%, 60%, no big deal. It happens all the time. What do you think, that, are there any different society implications this go around versus prior go rounds? Um, is it something uh, that you think is, is has a different impact at this time? I think this, this chain of lower interest rates 
and higher asset prices has gone on so long that it has obviously made worse the uh, inequality. Uh, there's been enormous wealth increment, but the income has not done nearly as well. The GDP growth of the US has slowed way down. And this is not me, this is just a question of fact. I'm happy to say I wrote a quarterly letter in 09 called basically seven lean years. And um, it featured, of course, um, the um, ancient Egyptians and Joseph and the, and the seven lean years. But um, the seven years after that were in fact way below trend. Uh, what I underestimated was that um, the 12, 13 years after that were all way below trend. Our productivity basically has gone to hell uh, since uh, the great financial crash or whatever we call it. And uh, so people have gotten rich on asset prices, but the underlying reality the supply of goods and services has been disappointing. So you have created a situation where the price of houses is selling at a higher multiple of family income than even the housing bubble. Stocks are selling at a higher multiple of price to sales than 2000. Every single death style uh, of most expensive to cheapest are way above 2000. And if you're a beginner, you can't really buy a house. You're being offered assets of all kinds, stocks at pathetic yields, lower than at any other time in history. And if you want to save your money in the piggy bank, of course, you pay for the privilege. This is absolutely dismal for the people without assets, for the bottom half, the bottom three quarters uh, have not benefited from the great inflation of asset prices, quite the reverse. They suffer because they can't, they can't participate. They, their parents could afford to buy a house at three and a half times income. They can't afford to buy a house at seven times income. Or if you have the misfortune to live in London or Paris or Vancouver, uh, 10, 11, 12 times income. This is unusual in that the US appears to be bubbly prices in real estate, but it's one of the lower one of the lower places in the developed world. Whereas in the stock market, it's the other way around. And most non-American stock markets are curiously reasonable. They're overpriced, but no big deal. Whereas the US is, is, is super crazy. And then of course, in, in other assets, bonds are uniformly ridiculous and rates are uniformly ridiculous. But even farmland and forests and so on, they're all selling way higher than they used to. But, but stocks are not too bad in, in quite a few countries. Well, and, and, and some of them painfully so uh, have been getting even, uh, even cheaper this past week. You know, you mentioned, um, I thought it was actually uh, your colleague, Ben Inker, wrote um, a, a thoughtful piece recently that touches on what you're talking about. You know, bonds not being a good alternative in the US, uh, they had a piece that showed during the pandemic, largely due to the, the yield starting at zero and negative in a lot of countries that, um, you know, one of, one of the most common um, assumptions you hear from investors in the US is that bonds will help in a downturn. But the example they gave was during the pandemic, bonds didn't help in the countries where they were, you know, many of the, the sovereigns were trading at like negative one already, you know, they actually hurt, they had negative yield. So yeah. that concept of bond diversification isn't one you can, you can count on. Yeah, that, that happened, of course, in the 70s. Um, we were running a value portfolio and uh, bonds dropped like a stone and stocks dropped like a stone and um, ev everything went down and the blue chips went down just as much as the junk, it was a, a horrible, even markdown of everything. We were in small cap value and that went down the same 50% that the Coca-Colas went down. Uh, the difference was then on the recovery, we were leaping up 20, 40% a year and they were creeping up five or 10% a year. And that became a massive uh, divergence in favor of, of, of the cheap stocks. The uh... 
you mentioned, you know, um, commodities certainly or, or real assets in general. We, we do polls on Twitter on occasion just to check sentiment. And um, we asked investors, you know, are you invested in real assets, whether it's REITs, commodities, tips, maybe. Um, but it was a very low percentage. I mean, most vast majority was was less than 5%. Um, and then there was like a barbell, there was like 20%, there was, you know, a huge percentage, but that's, I joke, that's all Canadians and Australians, um, no one else probably. Um, well, you can't seemed... have too much money in commodities because they, it doesn't exist. You are kind of locked in by, by how big those sectors of the market are. And uh, commodities have never been a, a huge component, a huge percentage of the S&P. But they have behaved beautifully in inflation, and they have this unique characteristic that over long term, they, they go in opposite directions. So if you have a decade with strong inflation, they do well and the rest of the world does badly. And in reverse, they do badly and the rest of the world does well. So they are real diversification, much higher quality diversification than any other asset you can pick. Yeah, you know, and, and the... Um... The challenge I think uh, a lot of people are facing this year, you know, we talk a lot about, we say, you know, one of the ways to deal with, um, everyone wants to focus on what to buy, what to sell, but, you know, we say one of the ways to think about portfolio construction is also to think about position sizing, um, you know, with, with whether it's individual security or an entire category. Um, one of the areas that you and I both, uh, both, think are, are um, a better opportunity set certainly has been emerging value um, and, and foreign markets in general. But as we see with geopolitical events, sometimes they can uh, uh, wake up and, and spring something totally new on you. Walk through how like an investor could, should think about events going down now with respect to um, an asset class like value in foreign and emerging markets and any ways uh, to think about it from somebody who's been through it? It's clear that in any drawn out setback in the market, uh, a value has been a great help. And um, in any category, uh, the cheaper ones do better. And the cheaper categories tend to do better. The, the trouble with geopolitical events is they can cut across that. If, if you um, go back to the, uh, to the 1920s and suddenly you take out Russia as a capitalist country, bang. Your uh, Russian bonds are good for nothing other than framing and hanging on <laughs> your office wall and uh, Russian stocks the same. And uh, and the same with World War II, your uh, Japanese and German holdings, you wipe out a couple of decades and then you start again. And they did remarkably well, of course, post-war recoveries are brilliant. They, they got back most of what they had lost, but they very seldom get back everything and those two never did. It's, it's highly unpredictable and wouldn't wish it on a dog. Uh, in terms of portfolio management, mm. because it can bounce, it can bounce either way, and it can bounce quickly. In this case, yeah, yeah, you know, it's a it's a a hard thing to um, to game plan for. We always say, you know, in China being another one that shut down markets for you know a, a while as well. But uh, looking at that history, um, we talk about our favorite. Uh, one of our favorite investing books, Triumph of the Optimist, um, and others like it that sort of give at least a historical perspective. And, and by the way, listeners, there um, we'll put it in the show notes, but Credit Suisse puts out a yearly update that's free. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tag it so you can take a look, but it's fun to look through because you can kind of check out some of these periods. Um, and they actually, this year, as they talk about inflation uh, and how, uh, how that impacts both um, stock and bond returns over periods. Yeah. A close reading of that book would suggest a better title, which is Triumph of the Lucky. Because uh, those people who avoid getting wiped out in a major war have simply done a lot better. 
it uh it has a good chart this year that shows um the benefits of diversification it says well theoretically a u.s investor could have been just fine sitting in u.s stocks and bonds but then it shows you know all 40 countries and say by the way the vast majority of countries would have been better off by diversifying because like you mentioned you know almost everyone has has gone through something that's worse than the u.s uh um, situation and extrapolating from the past, particularly with the valuations where we are now, um, you could end up with quite honestly, probably the opposite scenario. But I think the Russia's example um, and, and 50 other countries, you know, we could just li list one after another. I think one of the handful of countries that beat the uh, US is Sweden, who, who very carefully avoided both wars. Yeah. Switzerland, uh, you know, you could probably put in that category. They had one of the lower drawdowns, if I recall. But, uh, but in general, that's something anybody wants to bet all their money on. To me, seems um, seems challenging. So, I'm not sure. Um, and, and it wasn't just that the U.S. didn't get wiped out by invading armies. It it absolutely prospered uh, from war. Uh, the Japanese made one of the craziest decisions in the history of man. They, they attacked a country whose operating rate on the day of Pearl Harbor was about as low as it's been ever. So I think the operating rate in the US was like 70%. In other words, they could, they could by moving up to full capacity, they could fight a war and maintain the living standards that they had had simultaneously, which is exactly what they did. In fact, for the poorest 25%, they were better fed and better everything during the war than they had ever been. And, and they came out, of course, as the manufacturing base for the world and uh, much, much stronger on an absolute basis than they had ever been and much even stronger than that on a relative basis because the competition had been whacked. And a lot of the competition had been whacked 30 years earlier in the First World War. Yeah. How to get ahead is to have all your competitors have two world wars and, and end up supplying them with goods and uh, developing your industry. But if Japan had attacked at a time of maximum economic activity, then of course uh, the US would have asked for a massive uh, concession on the part of the average person. They'd have had to go back 20, 25% like they did in, in England. Uh, to find the resources to fight the war. And that's a very different state of affairs. Yeah. Um, people love to describe you as a bear or even a perma bear, but I like to describe you as arguably one of the world's most optimistic investors because of your foundation portfolio with venture capital and everything else that's going on there. Um, give us some updates. And, and, uh, and let, hmm? me, let me plug my one and only writing that was not a quarterly letter, which was reinvesting when terrified, that I insisted on putting out a very short two pager because I didn't want to wait, uh, that came out by sheer luck on the day the market hit its low, uh, saying, get your ass back in the market. And um, my, my only other claim was that there used to be something called the portfolio letter that's long gone. Uh, but the issue in, uh, in early July of uh, 1982, uh, quoted me, and that was the first quote I had ever had anywhere. And it said that we were close to an unprecedented rally in both the stock and the bond market, which is a pretty nice quote for uh, July, 1982. And uh, so those were the two real bear market lows, 1982 and 2009. Uh, everything else was an intermediate low. Uh, so that, that looks pretty good to me. And as recently as 2017, I was, I was the guy debating Jim Grant uh, on, on the topic, this time is different with him taking the value case and me taking the dudes, this time is really seriously different case. And, and as we think about that, what, what, would, uh, what would be the, the distance down where Jeremy would write uh, Investing When ter Terrified Part 2? Is that about a about 30% decline from here? We're 40% we're, uh, we're decline we're on the S&P? Yeah, um, 
about a 40% decline would um, probably have me write that letter. Uh, it might, next time it will turn out to be 20% too early. Um, but what the hell, if you, if you get close enough, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. On those, uh, on those sort of things, it tends to be, um, we'll be calling you the lone bull there. Um, but talk to me about the VC world. What's going on? You, uh, you guys still looking at the same themes? You still thinking about the same things over the last year, or are you guys turning your attention to other ideas? What are you thinking about? We were thinking about, uh, having marginal liquidity. Um, we were thinking about the fact that ev everything is likely to be marked down. And that certainly includes early stage new issues, um, particularly SPACs, of course, but even IPOs are all vulnerable because they're all at the very growthy um, end of, of the game. And they've had enormous enthusiasm. And therefore, of course, the VC portfolio has embedded in it one of the higher levels of enthusiasm, the way it did, let's say, in 98, 99. Uh, we hope it's much better off this time than 2000 because there is so much money uh, further down the pipeline uh, whose job description is investing as these new ideas get going. And that money may bail out quite a few enterprises. What, what happened in 2000 was that a lot of them were good companies and they failed because of the change in attitude and the liquidity had gone. And there was no money to be had. And they work on fairly short leashes, a lot of them, which you could argue is a mistake, but it's the way the VC industry functions. It has a time horizon of a year, 18 months, and it raises some more money. And so when pessimism comes, you have to hang on by your fingernails and sometimes you can't. And, um, and so there were quite a few cohorts by year that didn't do very well in 2000. And um, th this time, I think green is very promising. Uh, the countries of the world are getting behind the reality that they must decarbonize. They must um, have alternative energy supplies. And the one thing about uh, this crazy Russian behavior is that it's going to completely underline that Europe in particular can't depend on Russian gas or Russian oil uh, much longer. It's going to force them to spend much more money and take energy diversification much more seriously. But they haven't put nearly enough into R&D behind improved nuclear, whether that's fission or fusion. I am very optimistic about fusion and we have a couple of investments in it. But I, I think it's at least 50-50 we will end up with fairly cheap fusion. I say fairly cheap because the capital intensity of these things is so big that by the time you've amortized it over its 40-year life, that guarantees it ain't that cheap. This is not the nearly free energy one used to dream about in the 1950s, but it, it could be cheaper. Uh, it could be as cheap as wind and solar and, and be deliverable, you know, day and night, 24 hours. So it would be very nice to have around. And there are a lot of very exciting new ideas like fusion on, on the green side, agriculture full of interesting new new concepts um the uh you know you know it's 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 funny there's a quote you see a lot um on what is it the there's decades when nothing happened weeks when decade happens in this past week certainly feels that way this it feels like the narrative and shift around energy has totally changed you know whether it's in europe and america but people's attitude for a long time towards nuclear and towards a lot of ideas seems to like you know, that seven days later, it's like a, a, a new world we've all woken up in. It'll be curious to see. We actually talked about nuclear in the last um, show a year ago, and you see Terra Power getting approval in Wyoming. And, and I wonder how much this accelerates that. Oddly enough, I mean, there's a pretty long lag time on, on building some of these. But what um, you can, can do in the short term is you can get countries like Germany snap out of their uh, crazy daydream 
and not shut down the several nuclear plants that are due to be shut down pretty, pretty soon and extend their life for 10 years and so on, uh, which is probably an option. That, that, that alone makes a, makes a big difference on the margin. And you just have to start producing wind and solar and storage and, and upgrading your grid. America has a, a practically a medieval grid. Um, I, it's, it's odd what is happening in the US because you know last year in Europe, 14% of all the cars sold were electric cars. And in China, it was 11 and here it was three. Find me another dramatic new idea where the US has not led the charge. You know, if, if you back up 30 years, surely we would have been 20% to Europe's 14. That, that's what usually happens in a brand new idea uh, with lots of venture capital and lots of innovation. And, and indeed we have Tesla. Tesla's like a kind of reminder of where we should be. We should have three Teslas. We should be ahead of the world, not running along at a miserable 3%. Well, you know Europe. what it is, Jeremy. I tell you, the Americans love their pickup trucks. So when Ford launches this electric lightning, I'm telling you, that thing is going to sell a bazillion. If Elon just put out a normal pickup truck, he would be worth a trillion dollar market cap. Hey, right even thing. his abnormal <laughs> one, his abnormal one has a huge I... order list. He just doesn't have to build it. He's making so much money. He's building cars as fast as he can sell them. He's charging more than he ever dreamt he'd be able to charge. And um, he's going to crank up another 50% increase without, without risking uh, a, a, a fancy new pickup truck. Yeah. And then he'll do a pickup truck and it will be the best probably and so on right. and so forth. Well, I like the looks of the Rivian, but I'm I'm waiting. I I, I have a Tesla. I'm oh, I'm a Tesla owner. Car not stock, Me too. but um, but love it. You know, like I said, like it's yeah, you know, yeah. can't imagine not. Um, you know, normally I would ask you as we've been kind of rapping about everything. Um, say what sort of risks are you seeing? What are you thinking about? But that seems kind of quaint given <laughs> given uh, the news flow we've had over the past week. So I'll ask in a different way. Um, what else is on your brain? You know, um, this uh, this crazy world we're living in. Is there anything else in particular you're thinking about um, that we didn't talk about today that you're either excited, depressed, um, curious, confused about? Well, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunities that the longer term problems will present. The longer term problems is we're going to be short metals short food, short resources, short people. But then you flip that and you say, what do we have to do? We have to recycle much more. We have to redesign our products so that they're more repairable, that they are longer lived. They are more economical uh, with their use of, of metals. We, we have to find alternative materials. Uh, Biomaterials would be perfect um, in a sense that you grow them and, and you create micro uh, cellulosic fibers with strength like carbon fiber, better than steel, and lightweight materials that can replace cement and, and, uh, and steel. And uh, the, the list of innovations, we will have to get our brain around. We're gonna have to redesign batteries in particular. We don't have the lithium to produce the batteries for the cars we think we're going to produce. We don't, we barely have the copper, and we certainly don't have the cobalt, and we probably don't have the nickel, um, a lot of which comes from Russia, by the way. And the price of all of those has gone through the roof because they recognize uh, that we're in pretty miserable state already. You try quadrupling the fleet of electric vehicles, and um, we, we have real problems. But it is begging for a redesign, a new battery that doesn't use cobalt. Yes, done that. The batteries that use iron, of which there is a lot. Yes, we're doing that, which was surprising everybody. But we're going to have to keep redesigning, rejigging, replacing, and inventing new materials. And, and, and this is pretty darn exciting. We're going to have to find ways of retrofitting buildings cheaply, and uh, not the miserable 
labor intensive, high cost ways that we do it now. We're gonna to have to build higher, higher quality buildings that are on day one, hugely more energy efficient. This is going to take trillions of inventive dollars, not regular business as usual dollars. So this will be one of the great challenges and, and, and it will be an absolute godsend for the VC industry. And, and, and the great research universities, their research labs will have more ideas than they can shake a stick at for the next few decades. Yeah, we, we often tell investors, um, you know, the, the public markets are so full of uh, negative news flow consistently, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's just like the noise of CNBC and everything. Um, the startup and kind of research-based uh, companies, it's like the most optimistic thing in the world. And we, and we tell investors, say, look, even if you're not going to do angel investing, just go sign up and read some of these decks and, and listen in because um, it puts you in a, a better mood. And there's nothing I'm more optimal, optimistic and bullish on than, uh, than human ingenuity and uh, ideas that come out of some of our great thinkers and scientists and everything else. So it's a lot of fun and puts you in a better mood than uh, Watching the watching the tickers all day for sure. Yeah, we we saw one in the last month that is going to replace industrial nitrogen mm. by supercharging uh, bacteria that goes in the soil and grabs the nitrogen and 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 fixes it like a plant, and instead of dying in a few hours, it lasts a couple of weeks and, and can really, with a bit of luck really substitute for most of the industrial energy intensive nitrogen that we produce. And last Friday, uh, we, we saw a, a, a startup nuclear um, that is um, just leads us to think that in 15 or 20 years, we may have the first generation of fairly small fusion reactors. Reminds me of an old uh, Asimov book. It might have been Foundation that was talking about um, one of these topics with with uh, the populace, and it was an invasion. And um, said when people uh, really started to uh, give up on the invasion is when their inner their personal energy devices stopped working. I got to look up which book that is. Anyway, unrelated to what we're talking about, but um, but a, a good book nonetheless. So we were so, talking about um, what what's exciting. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. answer, I suppose, with any bad time, with any big challenge, is the opposite side of the coin. Is of course it comes with the great opportunities. World wars created such a surge of technological improvement. World War II really pumped up the U.S. in particular for the next twenty years. Ch challenges we just got to make it through the period right we just got we yeah. have to survive uh, uh the threats of nuclear war to get through uh to get through on the other side um hopefully it's good uh, to be on the winning side hopefully uh we can be doing this in a year and look back and uh and talk about how how this worked out um yeah Jeremy, it's, a, it's about dinner time there happy hour time uh best place to keep up with your writings now still gmo yeah no we're trying to get a paper out on the long-term shortages that might, that will, in my opinion, create longer-term inflationary pressures and therefore change PEs and change the rates and hopefully uh, balance the books a little bit back towards labor from capital. Um, I'm not anti-capital, but I am when it starts to crush the rest of the society the way it has done. And more recently, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think that's a, a trend that will probably be uh, secular uh, for, for quite some time. Um, and, and people are all focused, as they always are, on the next year or two. I get that. But uh, I'm much more interested in the period beyond that. What does the next 10 years look like? It looks like a period of shortage, invention, challenge, inflation, and cheaper assets. Whoopee for for those people who uh, are acquiring them. Not so good for people who are selling them. That's right. Well, 
Uh, if you're a young person, that's the best thing you can cheer for is a nice, big, fat Absolutely. bear market. <laughs> oh, and by the way, just let me make the point. Um, people don't realize that when you have cheap assets, that that 6% yield that you're reinvesting, a forest is a good example. You pay 6%, you buy another forest, 6% increment a year. When it doubles in price, what are you doing? You're now compounding at 3% a year. In 48 years, you're down to a quarter of the wealth you would have had in the 6% world, a quarter. And, and yet we all love high-priced assets. It's because we're all so short-term and, and basically a bit innumerate. We don't get it that cheap assets with high yields is a much better state to live in than high-priced assets and tiny yields, or in the case of bonds, negative yields. Yeah. Well, um, a lot of a lot of the low yields around today. I think uh, S and P was darn near plumbing the lowest dividend yield ever. I mean, uh, obviously the there's a growth difference with the buybacks, but it got it got darn near one uh, percent here in the last few Did months. It? I think it was one point two, somewhere around there. Um, wow. Well, Jeremy, uh, this has been a blast as always. Let's do this again. Um, stay safe and healthy. Thank you.